The Navisink, a crowning jewel shining amidst the town's picture postcard farms and pasture lands of New Jersey's Monmouth County. It has been called one of the most handsome bodies of water on the East Coast. Resplendent in all seasons, the Navisink River has beguiled people for centuries. The elegant mansions and estates which line its banks speak of a bygone era, rich in history. As do a few remaining determined souls who still ply the plentiful shellfish beds in the estuarine waters for a livelihood. Throughout the year, these waters bustle with activities. But all things considered, this is the ultimate river for lolling around on a lazy afternoon. However, beneath the obvious charms of the Navasink lies a problem which plagues many of the rivers and waterways throughout the United States. Pollution is nothing new in our lives today. Often the finger can be pointed directly to industry, development, or inadequate water treatment facilities. If pollution can be said to have any advantages, this type, known as point source pollution, has one. It can be traced to a particular source, controlled and eliminated. Now state and federal agencies have allied themselves in a major initiative to combat a form of pollution which only recently gained public awareness. This is non-point source pollution. In many ways, it is difficult to locate and control. It manifests itself quietly. Its contributors cover a vast cross-section of innocent or uninformed everyday people whose individual actions are collectively responsible for creating water quality problems. In the last 20 years, the Navasink's once rich fisheries have greatly depreciated. The oyster industry has been eliminated and severe restrictions have been imposed upon clamming. Ultimately, the voluntary efforts of many individuals with the cooperation of various governing agencies can lead to a solution. The Navasink watershed, modest in size, drains 95 square miles of northeast Monmouth County. Its headwaters flow through the upper watershed, which is sparsely populated and largely agricultural. Almost half the farms in the watershed are dedicated to raising and boarding horses. Some of the properties border directly upon the banks of the Navasink's feeder streams. These tributaries eventually meet, draining into the Swimming River Reservoir, the largest potable water supply in the Navasink Basin. Flowing in a northeasterly direction below the reservoir, the Swimming River joins the mainstream of the Navasink Estuary at Red Bank. Here, the lower watershed becomes more densely populated and urbanized to the east, but remains agricultural to the west, eventually draining into the Shrewsbury River, which flows into Sandy Hook Bay. The Navasink has been a river of many names, derived from a Lenape Indian word, it has also been known as the North Harbor, the Neversink Harbor, and the Neversink. Its derivatives can be traced to maps and manuscripts as early as the 1690s. From colonial times, the Navasink formed an avenue of commerce between rural Monmouth County and New York City. As the farmers prospered, so did the villages along the Neversink. By the 1850s, Red Bank was a well-established residential community and center for business. Fairhaven became a focal point for the oyster industry. By the latter part of the 1800s, the Jersey Shore became the nation's playground. The Navasink area became a popular summer retreat for New Yorkers hoping to escape the summer heat. George H. Moss, Jr., historian, author, and Rumson councilman, is well versed in the history of the Navasink. In those days, of course, there was no air conditioning. And uh, the Jersey Shore enjoyed, obviously, the unique 
locality of being on a bluff, Long Branch uh, in particular, and the Highlands. And as a result, of anybody that's familiar with the Jersey Shore, in the late afternoon, summertime, you usually develop a southeasterly breeze. And of course, this was a most welcome uh, part of the day. During those formative years, vacationers flocked to the area. Long Branch was considered to be the foremost watering spot in the United States, rivaling Saratoga and Newport with its magnificent beachfront hotels and homes and elegant gambling casinos. For diversion, there was sailboating, motorboating, and if this was not enough, the races. Monmouth Park Racetrack, operating to this day, reflects an equestrian tradition that is virtually unsurpassed in any other part of the country. One of the catalysts to develop the Jersey Shore was President Grant selecting uh, Long Branch as a site for the Summer White House. 1869, he was in the area. And of course, the uh, development of the railroad. The Central Railroad of New Jersey brought people from Philadelphia and New York and further distances. Many New Yorkers made the trip by steamboat. In the 1880s, the communities of the Navasink developed as an extension of the great resort explosion that was occurring along the coast. The corporate and Wall Street community found the Navasink and Shrewsbury to be exceptionally pleasant sites for their 30 or 40 room summer cottages, which even to this day are considered to be some of the finest homes on the East Coast. This area also attracted many famous statesmen, artists, musicians, great stars of the American theater, and writers. Raised among the writers and artists, musicians and politicians who frequented the area in the 1920s, Gertrude Neidlinger and her brother Travers remember those days well. You know, uh, coming from Montclair to what we, well, father and mother thought would be, you know, rural, the country, away from it all, we certainly walked into Cultural the most background. cultured uh, community you could possibly uh, get into. The fabulous um, professional people who were here was something to never to be forgotten. Well, I think that uh, in the 20s, when uh, we had uh, Rachmaninoff uh, over there in Locust, uh, giving everybody the biggest treat in the world. Uh, they were rehearsals for him every day, you know, and, and Pavlova was in the other part oh, of the house. the house. Yes, uh, they have the house. And uh, it was, it really was a treat for everybody in the area. And she used to dance on the lawn. Yes. The actors and the singers and the musicians in general that came down here did so because it was convenient to New York City. I really feel that it, it had a great deal to do with our pursuing the art. The Neidlinger's home is typical of the bungalow style of architecture, which became all the rage in this country in the 20s. With the Depression, taxes on summer homes rose sharply. The bungalow fell from popularity. By World War II, the tourist industry diminished, and towns around the Navasink became year-round communities. These communities brought a boom in the population and increasing demands on the river. Prior to this, the river was host to national motorboat races and sailboat races, as well as an oyster and clam industry so flourishing its products were shipped around the world. In 1884, C.P. Irwin founded Irwin Yacht Works, a business devoted to custom-building pleasure crafts. His sons have carried on the business to this day. But Ed Irwin remembers a time when oystering was vital to the family livelihood. Well, my father started in the oyster business in the late 1800s. And he used to have oyster beds along both sides of the river. And in these beds, he had them all staked out. So uh, no one else was allowed to oyster on your beds. They used to uh, dredge these oysters up. They took them up with tongs, oyster tongs and fill up barrels with the oysters 
back in, well, this is back in the, about 1900. And uh, they used to ship them to New York by a schooner. And there were five or six schooners that went from Red Bank to New York. He used to take these oysters up to New York in the Fulton Market. And uh, they brought the highest price of any oyster in the market. Then after the, the blight came in, well, that was the end of the oystering here, to commercially, as far as commercially is concerned. Of course, uh, we natives kept on oystering and eating them ourselves, but we never got anything yet. <laughs> so uh, the oyster business is about dead in the Navasink River. Jimmy White continues to soft clam the Navasink to this day. As with many others, he began as a child. In the ensuing decades, he has witnessed many changes on the river. The river, the Navasink, has always been had always been full of clams. There were places where they were very prolific, especially in the 40s when I was growing up. This was about the best time for the Navasink. There were plenty of clams all over in the. Uh, uh, area of the oceanic bridge, the, above the bridge toward Red Bank. So I always thought that the, the Shreveport, and especially in the Navasink area where the hills are, was a, a very beautiful thing. And clamming is a very beautiful thing. No one can really describe it. It uh, has to be experienced. Of course, you could always make a good buck on, on the uh, in the Navasink and the Shreveport River if you uh, if you want to work for a living. Uh, my uh, my grandfather had a business here in 1900. Uh, it was Birds and Nast. They uh, ran a clam bakes and they sold clams, and they also had a place where they opened them and sold them to places like Fulton Market or to Lundy Seafood or Hackney's in Atlantic City. During the 30s, the business was great here. We used to have sign no depression here. The Shrewsbury River and the neighbors thing is always the savior of the towns because they could always make a living out there. And in 1948, they all died in three days. And uh, the river was practically barren. And then gradually, the uh, neighbors thing came back. We work in it uh, periodically in different parts of it, from the Oceanic Bridge down. From the Oceanic Bridge to Red Bank, it's mostly along the shorelines, and we clam right where the oyster bed used to be, is where the clam spats are. And sometimes uh, they're very, very scarce. I think that has to do with the, the abundance of seaweed. See, the seaweed lays on the clams and kills them. And the seaweed is there as a result of the high nutrient in the water, and the high nutrient is a result of the horse farms and whatever. You have all these huge uh, lawns that go on down to the river. And whatever they put in them, on these lawns to take care of them, uh, why, God knows what they're putting in, into the rivers. I don't think the prognosis is good. I think that uh, uh, increasing activity and increasing number of people is just putting too much pressure on the environment. Unfortunately, today, shellfish harvesting along the Navasink is but a mere shadow of what it used to be. Clams are filter feeders, as are oysters and mussels. Because of this, shellfish are very susceptible to ingesting waterborne pollutants, such as bacteria and pathogenic organisms, which are particularly dangerous for human consumption. In 1961, following a widespread outbreak of hepatitis, directly traced to the consumption of clams from the Raritan Bay, the New Jersey Department of Health began intensive monitoring of the Navasink shellfish waters. After extensive studies revealed excessively high levels of bacteria in the water sampled, most of the 2,622 acres of waters were restricted from direct harvesting and marketing of clams, oysters, and mussels. They have remained restricted ever since. No recreational clamming is allowed at all, and commercial clamming is allowed only by a purification process known as depuration, or by relaying the clams to non-polluted sites outside the county. In spite of the fact that there is no direct harvesting, Richie Knapp remains a confirmed believer in the Navasink. Basically, I do it because I like to do it. 
We all do. We all complain, everybody grumbles, but to ask any one of them, they wouldn't do anything different than what they're doing. By working those rivers, you tend to promote growth anyway, promote new growth. Because by working the bottom, you stir up all the silt. And if there is a bad piece of bottom, that silt will kind of blow away with the tide. And it leaves a piece of productive bottom. And as a result of our working up there, we found now there's probably, the last two years, there's been a bigger set of clams up there than they've had in 25 or 30 years. I think primarily because we've been working it. Thirty-five years ago, there was probably five to six hundred people made a living up there, doing various things, either fishing or lobstering, clamming, soft clamming. It's just very gradually now, it's, God, I guess you cut it probably down to maybe 150, if that. And it all boils down to the same thing. Someday we're going to drown in our own garbage. After hours of raking since early dawn, the catch is taken to a relay site south of the Navasink in the Barnegat Bay. Each clamor has a specific lot staked out. Only hard clams can be relayed since soft clams cannot reburrow and quickly become subject to predation. Hard clams will reburrow in the sand. As they feed, water pumps through their siphons. After 30 days of filtering, they have purged themselves of bacteria. Samples are taken to the lab for testing to assure the clam's readiness for market. Both hard and soft clams taken from the less polluted waters, marked special restricted, may be cleaned by depuration. By boats are sent out or clamors bring their catch in directly to the processing plant. The clams are placed in large vats filled with water, which is passed through ultraviolet light to kill any bacteria. The holding tanks are temperature controlled to provide the optimal climate for clam siphoning. After 48 to 72 hours, the clams are purged of the bacteria that may have been acquired and are ready for market. While depuration and relaying have kept clamming alive on the Navasink, the industry has suffered greatly because of bacterial pollution. Hard shell clamming has seriously declined. Soft shell clamming, which in the Navasink and adjoining Shrewsbury River represents virtually the entire soft clam fishery in the state, has dwindled to less than 10% of what it was in 1950. The value of this unharvested resource has not only been a loss to individual livelihoods and the state's economy, it has brought on a much more serious problem. Illegal clamming in condemned waters and the potential of consumer health risks. In the 1970s, with the formation of the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, on-site septic systems in several small wastewater treatment plants were eliminated and replaced by regional sewer systems. Bacterial quality dramatically improved, but not enough to lift clamming restrictions. Since no significant point sources of bacterial pollution remain, in 1979, DEP's Division of Water Resources began the present study to identify and control possible non-point sources of contamination to the estuary. This proved to be no easy task. In an area which boasts two racetracks, one of the largest horse populations in the nation, a growing human population, and a river which is extremely attractive for development and water activities, the potential sources are many. Six years of continual water sampling and monitoring have identified the remaining problem on the Navasink as being a combination of stormwater runoff from residential and commercial development 
and from the agricultural lands and horse farms in the watershed. Stream samples taken from the agricultural horse farm areas where unmanaged exposed manure piles are commonplace showed high bacteria concentrations. Samples from 33 storm sewers following rainfall revealed increased bacteria contribution to the river. In the more populated areas, samples from the street runoff showed high fecal coliform counts attributed in part to domesticated pets. Marinas and boating also contribute to bacterial pollution via improper sanitation facilities or directly discharging the contents of a holding tank overboard. With the sources identified, George Horzeppa, chief of the Bureau of Water Resource Management Planning and supervisor of the project, is faced with the challenge of how to resolve a highly complex problem which demands the cooperation of so many. Public education is the key. Our challenge is to make the public aware that what they do as a result of their daily activities can have a serious effect on the river. To that extent, we have an outreach program on all fronts. Marinas can be part of the problem. Boat owners can take simple steps to avoid pollution in the river, such as not dumping fecal material overboard. Pet owners, for instance, can pick up after their pets. Catch basins are not garbage cans to dispose of waste. They're part of the drainage system, and anything that drains into them enters the river. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency has provided extensive funding to assist us in various public education programs. The cooperation of many federal, state, and local agencies is also paramount to the success of this project. In August 1986, a multi-agency partnership representing 15 environmental, health, and agricultural organizations formally committed their efforts toward the cleanup. Farmland management practices to control animal wastes, sediments, and other pollutants are being installed through a voluntary cost-share incentive program authorized by the USDA Soil Conservation Service through state and local soil conservation agencies. Both crop farms and livestock farms need to take long-term measures to prevent erosion. Areas such as pastures, paddocks, corrals, and riding rings, which are not stabilized by a ground cover, are prone to erosion by wind and rain. Nitrogen and phosphorus, nutrients found in cropland fertilizers and manure, find their way downhill to watercourses, polluting water supplies. Land and soil characteristics, stream locations, buffer zones, and waste management practices are evaluated through on-site visits. Bob Scrow, the project coordinator, meets with Ned Dowdigan, the manager of Due Process Stable in Colesneck, New Jersey. Um, so each day the wagons are delivered, the manure wagons are delivered to each barn. There's seven barns here. Uh, at that time, the workers here clean the stalls, the wagons are loaded, and the maintenance people pick up the wagons, and the manure and the straw is brought down to the muck pit on a central point in the farm. Uh, the manure pile is, is cleaned usually about once a week, depending on the time of year. During the winter, more often. During the summer, less often. And it's hauled away by a mushroom uh, manufacturer, grower in Pennsylvania, and he comes and picks it up. We're lucky here right now to be able to have it hauled away for nothing, but I'm sure it's going to be a problem in the future. Uh, some of the uh, farms in the uh, area uh, have that uh, problem where the uh, manure is uh, stored on site for one or two weeks before it's picked up. And that's one of the things that we're trying to uh, uh, help solve as far as uh, the uh, manure buildup problem. Uh, what we see is that the uh, stormwater runoff uh, generally carries bacteria um, from the manure downstream uh, into uh, nearby uh, tributaries that uh, feed the, uh, the Navasink River and shellfish beds. Um, we have a number of solutions that we're trying to uh, work out with uh, the uh, landowners like yourself. Some of those solutions include stormwater management detention. Uh, that is, uh, if we can get the stormwater after it comes in contact with the manure 
uh, to be retained in a pond uh, or some type of a, a burned area to retain the stormwater for a period of uh, 36 hours or so, that will promote the bacteria die-off and therefore prevent the bacteria from getting into the river. I think one thing that would really help some of the horse people in the area might be an educational aspect from you people to help us, because for us to do that would be a very simple project, and I, I think it would be something worth doing, but really I, I plead the ignorance that we didn't know that kind of thing was available or how to cure the problem. Ned, one of the uh, uh, most important parts of uh, our program is to work uh, with the landowners. There are many agencies that are involved in the project, and the real key to getting something done uh, to improve the shellfish beds in the Navasink uh, is a cooperative working relationship uh, with the landowner. And uh, we hope that uh, by being here and speaking with you directly, that uh, we can work out uh, our common problems together. Uh, we feel that uh, those of us that are part of the problem uh, are also part of the solution. The state of the Navasink will continue to be monitored and analyzed for a long time to come. When all the pieces of the non-point pollution control program are in place, the water quality of the Navasink is expected to improve. Clean water is an indicator that events occurring below the surface and in the surrounding environment are ecologically and biologically sound. The Navasink project is an experimental testing ground. If successful, it will establish a model for rivers throughout New Jersey and the nation and restore this beautiful river to its full glory.